Ah, this is such a good story. Today, we're dropping the needle on a track that a revolutionary artist wrote as a favor for his bandmate's side project. Uh, in need of a hit, this side band asked this prodigy if he had any extra songs that they could use. So completely off the cuff, he sat down with an acoustic guitar and he reeled off a demo, like in minutes. He didn't think anything of it. But then he checked on the song's progress a day later and he realized it was a really great song. He wanted it back. So he locked himself in the studio for a couple of hours and he whipped out a number one hit. And he promised to give his bandmate a co-writing credit and he tacked it on his album. Sent it all the way to the top of the Billboard charts. The only thing is, he never did share that writing credit. It's the story of how a stolen song became one of the biggest hits of his career. Now a actually broke up one of the biggest bands of the 80s. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember staying up late to watch Friday night videos, especially if you didn't have MTV or cable, I had to do that for a while, uh, you're going to love this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the bell so you always know when our interviews and videos are dropping. If you love music, you're going to dig this channel. Enigmatic, eccentric, uh, cloaked in purple. There is no one else like him in popular music before or since. There never will be. Prince Rogers Nelson, simply known as Prince, was a uniquely talented multi-instrumentalist and innovative musical genius and a prolific songwriter and producer, creating a storied, decades-long career of essential albums and hit singles, no doubt about it. Today, we're zeroing in on one of his biggest hits, great story of this one, one of his five number one hits, and one that has quite a bit of controversy surrounding it, since he more or less wrote it for a rookie band, and then he stole it back the next day when he realized how great it was. Guess he didn't steal it, technically, because he wrote the song. And then it broke up one of the 80s greatest bands. Talking about the classic hit, Kiss, from his 1986 album Parade. But the thing is, for all of Prince's genius, he didn't do it alone. I mean, maybe you can argue that he could have. Still, Prince knew that he had to surround himself with talented musicians who could bring his sonic visions to life. Later years, there was the new power generation and Third Eye Girl and... Uh, during his peak in the 80s, of course, it was all about the revolution. Prince put together the first pieces of the revolution in 1978, the form of a touring band. These early stages of the group consisted of Andre Simone on bass, Des Dickerson on guitar and vocals, Gail Chapman and Matt Fink, a.k.a. Dr. Fink on keyboards, and of course, Bobby Z on drums. Prince experimented with them as a side project, calling them the Rebels, and he recorded material with them in 1979. The project, however, was shelved like a lot of the stuff that Prince did. What did emerge in 1979, though, was Prince's self-titled sophomore album. Featured his first breakthrough hit in the U.S., I Wanna Be Your Lover. Great song. Prince's backing band would go through uh, some lineup changes in the early 80s, with Gail quitting in 1980 and Andre leaving for a solo career that happened in 81. But that didn't slow him any, as he released two more albums in that time, it was Dirty Mind and Controversy. Prince's 1982 double LP 1999 would feature some new faces, including Revolution Mainstays Lisa Coleman on keys and Mark Brown, a.k.a. Brown Mark on bass. 1999 would also feature a Revolution tease with the words and the Revolution written backwards on the album cover. Wendy Melvoin uh, then replaced Des Dickerson on guitar in 83, and the classic Revolution lineup was complete, ready to go. The Revolution would officially take the stage with the creation of Prince's global multimedia blockbuster film and album, Purple Rain, in 1984. Uh, Purple Rain, of course, reached number one on the Billboard 200, 24 weeks. It spawned two number one singles, When Doves Cry and Let's Go Crazy, along with two more top 10 hits, Purple Rain and I Would Die For You. Purple rain, purple rain. 
It was massive, to say the least, and the revolution was critical to its success, for sure. Then less than a year later, Prince and the Revolution were back on top with 1985's Around the World in a Day. That went to number one as well on the Billboard 200. It scored double platinum status, and it kept the party going with top 10 singles, uh, Raspberry Beret and Pop Life. Which brings us to today's feature. Next up, Prince looked to replicate the multimedia success of Purple Rain with a new Hollywood project. It's called Under the Cherry Moon. And with it, an accompanying album called Parade. Under the Cherry Moon. Starting with the former, Under the Cherry Moon was a romantic comedy drama that both starred Prince and was directed by Prince. Also appearing in the film was uh, former The Time member Jerome Benton and uh, Chris and Scott Thomas, actually making your feature picture debut. Hear it. The plot follows Prince's Christopher Tracy, a gigolo who moved to France to find a rich wife. However, his plans to seduce the young wealthy heiress uh, Mary Sharon go amiss when he actually falls in love with her. I'll leave it at that. Uh, the film would not become the cultural phenomenon that Purple Rain had. It was released in the summer of 86. Under the Cherry Moon underperformed both commercially, also critically. So at the box office, it tallied an embarrassing uh, 10 million globally. Decidedly less than Purple Rain 70 million, which was a lot more if you bring it to today's standards. Actually, Gene Siskel called it an absurdly bad movie. And USA Today warned, don't even turn up on the same continent where this is playing. Pretty bad. Under the Cherry Moon, it won five Golden Raspberry Awards and tied with Howard the Duck for Worst Picture. That, of course, was the bad news. The good news is that Parade would fare much better. The third and final album to be credited to Prince and the Revolution. Parade was released on June 3rd, 1986, just a month prior to Under the Cherry Moon. Work on the album got going at Sunset Sound in Hollywood, California uh, in April of 85, when Prince launched into a five-week marathon. There he recorded most of the album, plus some extras. During the first week of work alone, Prince laid down 10 tracks, as he was known to do. In fact, Prince kept so busy at Sunset Sound that practically never left. So studio director Craig Hubler, uh, he arranged to have a queen-size bed set up in the middle of the studio. Said Ubler about it, I, I brought uh, purple sheets and a purple bedspread, made up his bed, and the bed stayed there for quite a few weeks, making him feel right at home. The rest of the recording took place in the summer of 1985 at the Revolution's new rehearsal studio, the Washington Avenue Warehouse in Edina, Minnesota. Also essential to parade were its orchestral arrangements, which Prince asked Claire Fisher to head up. Fisher had notably already worked with Shaka Khan, the Jacksons, DeBarge, and uh, on the family's 1985 eponymous album. The plan was for Prince to attend the first scoring session for Parade, but Prince wasn't able to attend. However, when the orchestral tracks were delivered to him, Prince was elated. He was so happy with them that he gave Fisher complete control. And taking the situation to a superstitious extreme, Prince decided not only that it would be best for him not to attend future scoring sessions, but he would never even meet Fisher or even look at a photo of him. Fisher would ultimately leave his mark on dozens of Prince songs from then on. The two reportedly never met in person. Tallying over a million copies sold, Parade pretty much owes its success to just one song. The massive lead single, Kiss. Although three singles were released from Parade in total, the album's other two releases were not as successful. We already talked about Under the Cherry Moon not being so successful. Uh, the two other singles were Mountains, which peaked at number 23, and Another Lover, Hole in Your Head, that stalled at number 63. Good songs, though. I'll give you some chart details about Kiss in a few minutes, but first, let's get into the track. It's hard to imagine a more perfectly crafted, stripped-down pop hit, you know, with its funk-driven groove and Prince's falsetto vocal performance. 
I mean, Kiss is both sonically seductive and completely unexpected. But as good as it is, it almost didn't appear on the album. In fact, it wasn't even supposed to be a Prince song. I'll tell you that story right after I mention our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. The glasses that I always wear, with inflation out of control, Zenny is such a great deal if you need a new pair of glasses. You click on our info button right up here or link below. You can design your own pair of glasses for up to 80% off regular retail prices. You're gonna love it. Everybody I talk to loves it, seriously. Okay, so Kiss. Now granted, it did begin in the hands of the purple one as a quick demo. Kiss. But it was uh, immediately passed on to uh, his bassist, Brown Mark, and his recently formed band, Maserati. By this point, things were starting to get a little weird between Prince and Mark. He would say, uh, my relationship with Prince was very fragmented at that time. His focus was changing, and I started to wonder with the bass uh, disappearing in some of his music, notably in When Doves Cry, was he phasing me out? End of quote. But weirdness aside, Prince was still willing to share his creations. You know, not an uncommon practice for Prince. He'd often share his compositions with other artists. I mean, The Bangles, Manic Monday, Nothing Compares to You, stuff he did for Sheena Easton. Um, you know, just a lot of stuff. And then, of course, Sinead O'Connor took that one to the top. Just another manic Monday. Nothing compares to you. So Prince pulled Kiss out of the ether in April of 85 while he was recording at Sunset Sound. Brown Mark was one studio over, I guess. He was producing Maserati's debut album. Prince had already written a couple of songs to support this project. There was 100 Miles Per Hour and Jerk Out. Maserati liked the first one, but uh, they didn't like the second one, Jerk Out, which uh, the time actually made uh, uh, their only hit in the 90s. Crazy. Everything Prince did. Anyway. So they asked Prince for a song to replace Jerk Out, and Prince, being Prince, put his own session on hold. He just picked up an acoustic guitar and he improvised a minute-long stripped-down bluesy country song. No drums, no nothing, just a guitar and Prince singing baritone. You don't have to be beautiful. He laid it down on a cassette player uh, within a few minutes, all on the spot. Prince passed off this tape to Mark and the band and he said, do what you want with this song. Now, in response, Brown Mark was like, man, why are you going to give me this? Maserati, it's a rock band. But Prince just said, you know, just do your thing. So Brown Mark took it, he got to work, gave it a beat. Producer David Z, brother of uh, drummer Bobby Z, he added a gated effect on the guitar. And within a day, Kiss was on its way to becoming a pretty funky track. Kiss. However, any Maserati aspirations for this song would be short-lived. That's because the very next day, Prince overheard what they were doing in the studio, and he was so taken with the song, he asked if he could have a couple of hours with the track by himself, you know, just to see what he could do with it. When Brown Mark came back, I think it was three or four hours later, Prince played it for him, and now had Prince's vocals on it, and the bass was gone, and he added the song's famous guitar rhythm. That guitar rhythm, he actually borrowed from James Brown from Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. Papa's got a brand new bag. This is what Brown Mark said, and I quote, I looked at him and I was like, you did this in four hours? And he said, this is a song that will be better for us. And I was like, us? Who's us? Prince and the Revolution. And I was like, okay, does that mean you're going to let me be a co-writer on your album? And he said, yeah, you know, I'll take care of you, Mark. End of quote. Now, the only problem is he didn't. He was completely shafted. That's according to uh, Brown Mark's account. Kiss, of course, became a massive hit and a massive payday for Prince. Released as a single on February 5th, 1986, Kiss was a worldwide smash. It started in America, where it went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100, number one on the Cashbox chart and the Dance Club chart and the R&B chart. <laughs> 
Internationally, KISS was also just as big. It reached number 10 in Norway, number eight in Finland and Austria, number six in the UK and Canada. It went to number three in Belgium, Switzerland, and the Netherlands, and it went to number two in Australia. The song also netted Prince a Grammy Award in 1987 for Best Rhythm and Blues Vocal Performance. And beyond that, it's widely considered one of Prince's best songs, right? And one of his most popular. Racking up uh, roughly half a billion streams. So yeah, KISS turned out to be really successful. But as it turns out, Prince never gave Brown Mark a songwriting credit. Said Mark about it, in the end, I didn't even get paid for it. He totally stiffed me. According to Brown Mark, he never saw a dime. Afterwards, whenever you heard Kiss on the airwaves, all he could think about was how much money he didn't make off of it. Helping push Kiss over the top with the song's provocative music video, of course, directed by fashion photographer Rebecca Blake. Uh, the video first features Prince in a half shirt and leather jacket, and then shirtless, as he performs his own unique brand of choreography. Opposite him is dancer Monique Manning, who is dressed in a flowing veil, black lingerie, and sunglasses. Meanwhile, Revolution members uh, Wendy Melvoin sits on a stool playing guitar. So as far as pop culture goes, Kiss has had a few different media placements over the years. Uh, it's in My Stepmother is an Alien, Great Use and Pretty Woman. Oh, extra time and your kiss. Gulliver's Travels, uh, Shameless, Happy Feet and Glee. I just need your body, baby. KISS has also been covered by Sheila E., John Mayer, Bare Naked Ladies, Maroon 5, New Kids on the Block, Expose, Jeff Buckley, yes. oh, yeah. Brian McKnight, Lady Antebellum, Alicia Keys, Ed Sheeran, KT Tunstall, and uh, Kelly Clarkson. Also, Tom Jones actually covered it with Art of Noise uh, in 1988. And it went to number five in the UK, and it went to number 31 in the US, so it charted again. Okay, so clearly for Brown Mark, getting Kiss stolen out from under him was the last straw. Granted, Prince's version is a lot better than Maserati's. You got to not talk dirty, baby. I mean, come on, Maserati does not have that super funk or the undeniable charisma that Prince always brought to the table. But if everything Mark has shared is true, he should have at least received co-writing credit, right? This was really the last straw for the revolution bassist. Uh, his relationship with Prince was circling the drain anyway. And it wasn't long before he called it quits. In his words, and I quote, I had to quit before the parade tour. The revolution didn't know that. Prince wouldn't let me tell them. But I'd had enough because things were changing so rapidly. There was a lot of internal stuff going on, so I decided to move on, end of quote. And honestly, the rest of the revolution wouldn't last that much longer. Tensions were rising between you know, band members and Prince, and it all came to a head during the tour to support parade as Prince started enlisting new musicians. He more or less phased out the revolution's classic lineup. New faces included saxophonist Eric Leeds, trumpet player Matthew Bliston, guitarist Michael Weaver, backing vocalist slash dancers Jerome Benton, uh, Wally Safford, and Greg Brooks, and also Wendy's sister vocalist Susanna Melvoin, uh, who's also engaged to Prince. Then on September the 6th, uh, Sheila E. replaced Bobby Z on drums for the entire soundtrack in Osaka. While on stage two days later, Prince wouldn't even look at his revolution bandmates. Said Wendy, and I quote, I knew something shifted our last night um, at the stadium. He started calling a whole bunch of different people on stage with us while we were playing. And he hadn't done that before, and I knew him so well, and he, he wasn't looking at us. I could just feel it. And then we played Purple Rain and he destroyed the guitar. And I looked at Bobby and I went, it's over. I looked at Lisa, it's over. Shortly after the conclusion of the parade tour, Prince invited Wendy and Lisa 
to dinner at his Beverly Hills home and he fired them both on the spot. He also informed Bobby Z that Sheila E. would be taking his place on drums. It was all made official on October 17, 1986. In an official press release that the uh, revolution had disbanded, only Dr. Fink stayed. Of course, you remember a new backing band officially debuted in 1990, the new power generation, but that's a story for another day. Uh, fast forward to the passing of the great one, Prince, on April 21st, 2016. The members of the revolution announced that they were getting back together. To kick things off, they paid tribute to Prince on September 1st, 2016 at First Avenue in Minneapolis. Uh, the set, it was 19 songs in all. It concluded with three encore tracks, one of which was, you guessed it, Kiss. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Prince and Kiss. What are your memories of the song? What do you think about the revolution versus the new power generation and everything in between? Let's have a great discussion about Kiss, how it's been used in pop culture. I love how they used in Pretty Woman. Don't you just love Prince? More than life itself. Just such a funky song, so catchy. One that we've all sung, I'm sure. Let's talk about it below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. Check us out on Patreon. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, records and the truth.